And day zero look like, or what were we trying to solve? If we were by then in the center one and one IT security um, department helping um, various business units uh, develop and operate thousands of um, applications, and uh, every now and then we were approached by people asking, okay, so um, I'm developing this particular product, what should I uh, comply with? Um, what is my goal, how to, how to help to make it safe. And what we did, as we had this quite often, we by then got the ASVS uh, uh, program, so the, the version 1.0, uh, and we kind of adapted it um, so that it was more proactive rather describing QA activity. So we made a developer view. Now, there you have a lot of parameterization ongoing, so what am I supposed to do when I do a web service, internal, external, web application, SPA, and so on. So we put all this into an Excel, a very large Excel, where we could parameterize. So we said, okay, these 100 accounts are relevant for you, per se, if you do web service, um, this is which requirements are uh, relevant for various criticality classes, and so on. And in order to prevent 20 different Excel versions being in various mailboxes, uh, then we simply created one Jira ticket for um, every application, which we are guiding by this uh, process, and to which simply we've attached the um, uh, Excel file, or the various Excel files with all the, all the history. Now, um, that was a good history, a good, a good beginning, but nevertheless we um, early uh, ran into various issues. Um, the first one was that Excel is not the most favorite tool of, of um, developers, so this um, looks pretty biorepetic, and, and then every now and then everyone uh, forgets to upload the, the Excel file, etc. And as well, what we found out that um, many of the particular requirements which were in the Excel table basically translated into Jira tickets. So people ended up copy and pasting from Excel to Jira one by one, maybe 50 requirements or even more. And we were trying to fix it. And um, so the idea of Security Red was born. And uh, basically what we are trying to fix or how the workflow should look like. First, the user is typically a product team or a member of the product team, it might be secretly the champion, but also any developer or any product owner, any member. And first, I want to tell what I am working on. So, what's the criticality, what's the um, artifact type, what technology I'm using, etc. And then I get the list of requirements which I should per se comply with. Uh, what's here important? Um, I should comply with those requirements um, unless I have a very good reason not to do so. So still my um, third step is to decide, okay, is it okay for me to cope uh, with and, and implement all of these or um, is the implementation of certain requirements not economical anymore and I want to skip those and just record the decision then actually decided to do it this way. Then, similar as with the Excel table, I want to persist it somewhere centrally with the idea that any single member of the product team can easily see these reaches. And if I'm tasked as a member of the product team to develop new feature, other than I know already the rules of the game, so to say, which have been agreed for continuous development. And uh, what I especially want after the experience with, um, with Excel is to automate everything as much as I can. So I don't want to copy and paste every single ticket um, uh, by hand, but there must be a solution for that. And we have also a second stakeholder, application security, product security, IT security, however you call it, which is typically um, tasked with uh, transparency. So which rules are we opening, which not, and what impact does it have on, on our um, applications and customers? And um, second, also, if I'm tasked with a code review or penetration test or architecture review, for instance, I can open the records for these applications. I say, okay, within the architecture review, I have these five applications talking to each other. 
these are the requirements which are fulfilled, these are which not, and this is the risk which comes out of, of these all these parameters and one as one input to this activity. So uh, this was kind of the idea what we had, what we are trying to um, implement, and now Rene will show you how it actually looks like. Okay, thanks a lot. So I will give you just a brief introduction about Security Red. Uh, check. So this is actually the main page of Security Red. When you install Security Red or deploy it in your environment, usually the requirements database is empty because Security Red is just a shell. You have to insert your own requirements set. In our demo, which is running here, I've already implemented OWASP ASVS version 3. Um, we also open source this requirement set, um, so you can start with Security Red and OWASP ASVS v3 directly. But we usually recommend to the companies you should adapt it, uh, fitting to your needs, because every company, especially for Bosch, we have a huge requirement set for internal security requirements. I think now my catalog is more than 400 requirements, um, because we have kind of special needs there. Um, at the moment, I'm also working on OWASP ASVS4, so this will be somehow um, yeah, published to the repo soon when I find time to implement this. So going back to Security Red, usually what's the point to start with? Um, we want to define a new artifact. Usually we call everything an artifact. That can be a microservice, it can be a project, but we usually try to narrow it down to an artifact, which is as small as possible in your architecture. Um, Additionally, to the requirement set in the database, I define so-called artifact properties um, for a requirement set. Those are freely configurable. You can put inside whatever you like here. So this is just for the demo. Um, I use the levels. Um, the levels are coming from ASVS. So let's assume we want to develop a level 2 standard app. Let's maybe call it Fubar app. And let's give it some parameters. Oh, let me put the site down. That's better. <laughs> Okay, let's say, okay, um, this is maybe a front-end application. Again, you can add as many collections as you want. You can have back-end application, database, whatever you like. It's free um, to configure it. Authentication in this app is going to be handled by a single sign-on client, for example. Um, let's have session, managers, session management as well in our application we're going to develop. Let's say it has session ID and reachability. It's going to be an external uh, application for customers. And so those are my defined requirements. And if I hit now generate, Security Red will look into the database of ASVS and will try to figure out what are the best matches now for those kind of parameters. So instead of looking at a, I think ASVS v3 is 130, no, 183 requirements, we narrowed it down to 112 requirements. So the developers, of course, it's already, um, it's still a big list. But you will, um, not having the developers tell you, oh, really, 180 requirements, just tell me what I need to do. So we narrowed it down here. So what you see now is, you see each requirement um, with the um, based um, requirement category. You see a description of the requirement. I already enhanced some of the requirements um, with a column called more information. So I put all the um, OVASP security cheat sheets to the relevant requirements here. Again, those columns here, are freely customized. You can call them whatever you like, you can name it um, whatever you like, what best fits for your needs. For example, at Bosch we have also a severity and likelihood drop-downs to immediately um, get the risk if you don't fulfill this kind of requirement. And again, this is freely configurable. So usually what we tell them now the projects is um, sit down with the project team, maybe the architect to project lead, on also a, a lead developer, for example, and go through each requirement and ask them, okay, do you actually do this? Is this something we need to do? Um, or do you already fulfill it because you maybe use some kind of framework which is like for session IDs, you're using maybe Python Django and use the Python built-in from Django session management. So um, as you see, you go there, uh, usually let's have a quick example, verify that all application components are identified and are known to be needed. This is more of a design requirement from ASVS. Let's say, yeah, okay, we've already done this. I put that here done with a meeting, whatever. And you go through this whole list now. This is usually the approach you should do. Um, you can also filter everything based on uh, categories, like for example, what we have. Uh, let's go to malicious input handling and say here, for the 5.10, verify that all secret queries are stored in um, procedures. 
Um, we say done by Django, for example. Okay, let's try to and say, um, okay, yes, this is fulfilled. Okay, so um, you get the idea how to actually fill this out. Now comes the part, okay, we've done through the list, but we need to persist it somehow now, huh? because we, we need to want to have this in a workflow and we want to have the, the, the architects and the developers know their tasks. So what I can do is I can just click hit on save and I have different uh, possibilities where to export it. At the moment we are supporting Jira integration and export it to a flat file. We usually recommend doing it to Jira because it's more feasible. Um, you can define your, your base Jira URL in the settings of um, Security Red, or you can just put in um, some kind of um, queue you have with an URL. Um, if I hit export now, um, it will talk to the Jira API and will ask, okay, the project is called Art. Um, we will um, insert some kind of default things, you can easily adapt that, and we'll also look up what kind of issue types are possible for this queue. As I've created this queue in Jira, I just have one issue type in there called artifact. So this is basically my main ticket for that kind of uh, artifact. So let's hit, hit export, and it will tell you, okay, I exported it um, to Jira. Let's have a look. Um, so we have now a Jira ticket with our information about the, the application and what it has done. It has attached uh, as a YAML file all the security requirements we've seen. So now, but this is still, it's the artifact ticket. It's nothing we can use for the developers right now, but it's more for the architect, he knows what to do. Security Red will also, it will post in your name for Jira, so there is no need for permissions. You as a user of Security Red just needs um, the, the permissions to actually create tickets in that queue, because we're using course headers for that. So it will also post some kind of uh, comments for you, like um, a new, it's calling it weird. Um, it will post something, hey, a new uh, artifact was created, here's also, um, there is a new version where you can directly click on it and import it. So if we just click on, for example, this one here, this link, um, it will automatically now import um, the artifact and you see all the things we have here. Because we are not persisting anything in Security Red. Security Red runs completely in the browser, the requirements are stored in the database, but everything I put in here it's just in the browser, and it's just in the client storage of the browser. So you have to somehow persist it because it's not persisted in the backend. Um, so what we can do now is, as we have said, okay, um, we've gone through the list, we have saved it in our artifact, we now need to derive our tickets for the developers uh, because we want to assign them the tasks, what they have to do. Um, so I can filter on, let's do for the yes ones, just as an example, um, the ones I've filled out. Uh, it's those two. I can uh, select them all and can say action was selected. I can also export it everything to Excel, but this is kind of a duplicated features. Uh, for example, we're using the Excel export to evaluate external companies because they do not have access to our internal Jira. This is where we usually pump out our requirements in an Excel sheet. But here, if you are working internally and your developers have access to your Jira, um, we usually recommend doing this. So create Jira tickets. Again, um, it will tell you, it will tell me what's um, the base URL for your Jira instance. You can now give also a different instance, no matter what. And just type in the queue name. Um, this one is called Agile Dev. I'm you no, okay, that's also yeah. It's also fine. So, um, what it will do now is. It will do um, a batch job creation. So ah, first of all, again, it's, uh, it's asking the queue uh, what kind of issue types are in there. You see now it's totally different because we're asking the Jira API. So let's say it's some kind of story for the developers. We can also add more labels um, into the ticket. And now with hitting create tickets, it will batch create those tickets into the queue and, then with, and you have assigned this. Um, if we now look back at our main ticket, um, the artifact ticket we have created. We will see also an update there. What you will see now, a second attachment has been placed because we did actually an update to our requirements set. So every time we do an update, it automatically also updates the base artifact ticket. So because of versioning. 
And what we see now, also the new tickets, they are now also linked in the Jira ticket. So you also see, okay, what's the status here. And we have new comments because we did an update, so we can also import those again. And having a look at it, I want to show you now is, what you see now is, we have a new column um, is there, it's called status. And it will again ask um, Jira what's the status of the ticket. So we see immediately, have your, de uh, have your developer done your job? So let's, for example, actually go inside one ticket. Um, I have it open. So, and let's say, for example, okay, this task, it was done by the developer. Uh, we have uh, actually done this. And you as a project manager, do I have the space to do somewhere? Here. Okay. And... Let's do an import, not for a specific version. What we also support is if you click the baseline, uh, base link for the, um, for, the, uh, for the security red URL, it will look into the ticket and it will look how many attachments are there. So, and you will see directly uh, how many versions are stored in, inside this ticket. So you have kind of, kind of some version control in place that you see how, uh, when some people have worked on the, um, the requirement set. Um, let's import the newest one. And what we see now is, um, we see now the ticket status is done. We can also filter uh, immediately, so have the developers achieved all their tasks, uh, and everything is done. So it gives you a, a very quick overview about your status, and of course, um, you can track everything now. Um, but what about the requirement set, if it's changing? Because usually, um, what um, I do encourage, and I usually update my requirements very often, Especially for Agile teams, this seems very hard to achieve. Um, so let's make a quick example. I am the admin of Security Red, and I'm the actual owner of the requirement set. So of course I can modify them. <coughs> so we just do a quick uh, update here and say, cool new update, whatever. I just update the text here. I could also add new requirements um, or delete requirements. I'm just typing in cool new update and do I have it open somewhere again? Where's the new ticket? So and uh, let's import um, the current version again. And what you will see is uh, in red on the right side, well, immediately a new button popped up. It's called updates available. What security red does is if you're imported, as this is just imported into the browser, it will talk to the back end and will look up what requirement set is loaded in the browser and will derive um, the, the, the differences between the back end. And will check, are there any updates on the current set, and which of course only fits to your current set. And if I hit updates available, um, what it will do, it will tell me, okay, we found a new update, one was updated, Zero were um, new, because, because I could have also added new requirements to the specific parameters, or I maybe even removed one. And the, the team now can decide, you see directly in red, this is the old requirement. Here we mark up what was the update, and as a team can directly decide, yeah, okay, that makes totally sense what Renee put up in there, let's update the requirement set. And just hitting the green button, and your requirement set is updated, and you can, yeah whatever is inside there. And now the save button also went red. Just save it again, and we have the new version also stored in the Jira ticket. So this was just for giving you um, a brief introduction about the core functionality of Security Red and how we uh, live the process at one and one in Bosch. This is also, you also of course see um, your settings, what are currently loaded. And now Daniel will show you some more uh, features we've implemented in the last year, or last two years. Yeah, so <coughs> this could, obviously this is not a requirement set which uh, we would be um, using as an asset. Every company has to create their own set of requirements derived from compliance, security policies, etc., etc. And um, we also use more these columns. For instance, here we added more information. We started, okay, more information, motivation, definition of done for the particular requirements. And also what we... The first version, what we had was a um, link to the OWASP testing guide. So if the requirement was, okay, ensure there is no success, you sanitize your output to, to browser or also link to testing guide how to, how to test it. So it was, okay, how do we do QA for these requirements? 
And um, then we came up with the idea, okay, um, what do we try to um, automate it? And we um, um, called it uh, Security Cat internally, not as a uh, big um, uh, or just a small, small, small lion, but as a compliance automation um, tool. And how it actually looks like, we also open sourced, a, let's say, POC for this, how you can implement it in Python. It's available in the Git repository. And what do you do? I just put all these. So how it works, if I just um, create an artifact without any filtering, so I can say here, okay, I just want to have these requirements which are testable. I can mark them, I can say I want to test them. And here, now I can, uh, what we did was that um, we found that certain requirements are best to test, for instance, against your QA instance. Some of them is better to check out the Git repository and have a look in the code. For some of them, for instance, we use Sonacube as the old information is already there, so you can just um, um, enter the address. So here we just take yeah, some... Yeah, yeah. yeah, you have to just show the requirements because you filter them and nobody sees ah, which sorry? way actually. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. here for, with the proof concept, yeah. Thank you. Uh, here with Pro Concept, we just wrote it for three SVS requirements. Um, if you cannot uh, read it, is uh, the first one is kind of obsolete, uh, public key pinning. Second one, strict transport security and headers. And second is the preload um, uh, function. So you see, in reality, you will have quite a lot of requirements which are very difficult to test automatically. For instance, some business limits and similar stuff. But what you will find out is that actually quite some of them you can kind of test uh, generically. So um, just to open again, so here I can send the, the URL, for instance, if I'm testing security headers, I can have a look at the site. And now um, security, um, Red is talking to security cat, which is actually testing um, the um, requirements and what this gives back is the result. So what the tool thinks, is it uh, filtered or not? Uh, what's the confidence level? This is something what we've been working quite a lot because um, here with HTTP headers flags or something, it's very trivial, but sometimes, for instance, if you do XSS test, we used uh, various tools, then you only have certain degree of confidence for you. And also it gives back some message. So for instance, a proof material where the reader can easily um, uh, see uh, why the tool thinks that it's filtered. So um, this was um, one thing what we what we found out as a best practice is to um, typically have in a, somewhere in a Docker Compose file, for instance, the whole security cat so that you can ensure that the security cat and can always reach the services which um, it is supposed to talk to according to how your infrastructure is divided and um, separated. So that was uh, one thing. Um, second thing we did, um, What's quite um, critical is that um, you typically don't want your product teams to see the um, developers for the first time where they are actually working for them, but you want to have some kind of uh, training for those requirements. So this means quite a lot of PowerPoint work. And what we found out was that the requirements kept developing, but it's really hard that if you update uh, your requirements to have some kind of workflow where you say, okay, and I must not forget to update also the PowerPoint slides and all other queries. So um, then within a thesis, uh, we developed um, another feature, which is for trainings, where I can create trainings, for instance, Bar. Um, I can say, okay, this will be training for, I don't know, only mobile developers, so I don't need to give them the training which they don't uh, care about, and then I generate the slides. And now it kind of creates, um, using um, uh, Reveal.js um, slide deck for requirements, 
where the slide deck is also um, updated automatically. And um, now, of course, um, you want to work with some internet uh, content. So by default, it, it only gives you Gives you certain slides, and for the particular for the particular requirements, it gives you just text, which is typically not very cool. And here comes also kind of the strength of Reveal.js, what we found out, because let's say you want to add a new slide, how to implement this requirement, and for instance, you can create templates, and you say, okay, there is either a picture or uh, what's really powerful is that you can um, use the code libraries and you get all the code highlights and so on uh, for free using the JavaScript libraries. Or you can add, for instance, um, short YouTube video or, or whatever you like. So you can basically leverage all the features, everything you find somewhere, somewhere online, including shells if you want to show some demo and so on. So then you Save it, and now basically you ended up with a slide deck, which is automatically updated um, uh, whenever you change your, your requirements, and basically you are ready to go to the, and um, give the training. So here, for instance, it's some interactive content. Yeah. So these are the two newest features and I would give it back to René to talk about our next plans. Yeah, so in the background we're currently working heavily on version 2. Um, what you've seen is version 1.7.9 which is very very stable um, nowadays um, but we did a feature freeze now for that. We only do bug fixes for version 1 anymore because we want to develop version 2 and within version 2 we decided get rid of everything. Just rewrite everything. <laughs> because Having starting with the projects, and we were not so much experienced developers, of course we fell into the usual traps, we built a huge monolith. <laughs> so version 2 um, will be more microservice oriented, um, we are more acting as a platform for Security Red, you have your requirements management as one uh, microservice, uh, you have the gateway as microservice, and uh, for example, um, the, the feature Daniel just showed, like se security training. Um, we sometimes develop features and we, we see, do, do they work out in our product or not? And with a microservice-based architecture, we usually can get rid of them again. <laughs> because now it's not so easy in version 1 to get rid of features because they're heavily integrated into the monolith. Um, so this is something that the whole architecture will be changed in version 2. Um, what we also want to achieve is more requirement modernization. Um, so we want to have more levels for the requirements. So if you create your artifact in the beginning, you can define even more parameters um, or various level of requirements. For example, I will have a backend application. It is written in Java and we are using Spring Boot. So we want to even more customize the requirements in the end. And if you just hit, and you can also define, say, this is your backend application, and I do also develop a front-end application in my architecture together, but this front-end application will be, for example, AngularJS. Um, just de define it during the, the creation phase of the, um, of the artifact and then hit generate and you will get even a more customized requirement set especially for your needs even for your framework. Of course you actually have to then define in your backend what to do in Spring Boot. <laughs> um, yeah, we will, what's a, a feature we get requested a lot? At the moment Security Reds provide the REST URL um, for the backend so you can pump in your, back, uh, pump in your requirement set or you're using the GUI, um, I've just shown you where I edited the requirement. Um, there's a CRUD interface um, you can easily use to import your requirements. But uh, if you have a huge requirement set like we as Bosch, um, yeah, we want to something like have some kind of importer. So version 2 will have some kind of important functionality like a wizard where you can say here I have a CSV file or an Excel file with my or requirement set and just import it into to the database and then you can adapt it a little bit to parameterize it. Uh, but you get uh, get rid of the nasty click new requirement click new requirement, <laughs> but you only have to do it once. <laughs> okay, and next one would be yeah we want to integrate uh, more with um, other tools. 
Um, at the moment, Jira is our main focus, um, but given that, that we have a microservice architecture, we can make that more easily to integrate, for example, with Git, to have a look into the Git, role for, Git repo and have also some kind of testing functionality there. Uh, Confluence is something we also use at Bosch quite a lot, so why put it into Jira? We could, we could use the artifact as the main thing maybe in Confluence to document it there. Slack is also something we want to have a look at, so this is our current outlook for version 2. Okay, so um, that was basically it. Um, just to summarize it, um, the most important is the, our vision, I would say, the clarification, because we get a lot of requests, okay, like, why are you behind with the OWASP space VS, or like, um, um, I have like the requirements, like, do you also work on the content? And for us, it's important, we see the project as, let's say, the optimization platform, but for any kind of requirement. So we are, as a demo for instance, we are using the SVS, um, but we assume that every organization with a certain level of maturity has their own requirements. So we are not kind of looking into, into that. So in, um, you as a consumer of the tool needs to know, okay, what are your issues and what, how, how your requirements look like. Um, Interestingly enough, we wrote the tool with uh, security in uh, mind, but what we've seen meanwhile quite a lot is that people see it, we show it somewhere, and they say, ah, that's cool, I would like to use it for project management, for like creating checklists that I went through everything, or for normal development, or for anything else. So, um, are you, if it matches for you, of course, uh, and use it also for non-security projects, some kind of parameterization and requirement management tool, our focus will probably uh, stay for security also, also in the future. Yeah, and obviously, um, if you like it, if you're missing some feature, um, any forms of contributions are welcome, both QA, if you find a bug, um, create a GitHub issue, if you have um, the requirements that you would like to open source, um, then um, also um, get in touch. We would put it into also um, some um, into repositories so that anyone can um, find it if there's something what has worked for you. Yeah, and of course, if you if you're missing the feature, what's most appreciated is if, if you uh, create a pull request and actually implement it. And that's it from our side, and we are open for any questions you might have.